Creative Control with Vish Khanna. Before I tell you what's happening on this episode, I'd like to congratulate my sister Anita and her partner Beth. They just had a baby girl. Ronnie, I'm an uncle. I am an uncle. Congratulations to me and to them. They're going through the sleep deprivation, what the hell's going on kind of phase. And uh, I am basically uncle public health at the moment. We, I get the calls, I get the texts. It's fun. I like saying, it's going to be fine. Put the diaper on the right end. Everything will be fine. It's it's fun. It's fun <laughs> talking to new parents after going through it a couple times myself. And uh, yeah, so yeah, congrats to them. Okay, this episode is uh, an, uh, features an interview with uh, a very funny comedian named Cameron Esposito. And uh, it was set up because she was scheduled to perform some makeup shows in Toronto at the Comedy Bar. She uh, was, was supposed to be here earlier in the summer and couldn't make it, so they rescheduled them uh, to this uh, month. And unfortunately, we've just learned that uh, she's again had to postpone these dates due to uh, scheduling conflicts. So you're going to hear me during the, the proper intro mention those dates. Uh, don't go. Don't go to the Comedy Bar. They're trying to get something else together. Uh, maybe it'll be fun. I don't know. They, they're still trying to figure it out. But because the conversation was sort of topical and, and interesting, I thought I would share it now. Uh, I'm not sure when she'll uh, be coming back to Toronto, if she will be able to come back to Toronto, because she's got other tour dates. She is coming to Vancouver, which we discuss on the show, and uh, you'll learn about that towards the end of the interview. Anyway, she's very uh, funny and very thoughtful, and this is a bit of a contentious conversation at times. Uh, we talk about comedians and perceptions of comedy, perceptions of, of her... And I think it's good. I think it's interesting. I think you'll like it. This is myself and Cameron Esposito. This week, the Bookshelf Cinema is screening Amy, Samba, Mr. Holmes... Menu and more, and at the E Bar, Humans and Free and Loesch play together on September 11th, and the next night, September 12th, throwback to vintage music and burlesque with Rock and Roll Rebels. The bookshelf is an independently owned cultural hub located at 41 Quebec Street in Guelph. For more information about their hours, listings, blogs, accessibility, and directions, please visit bookshelf.ca. Cameron Esposito is a gifted and hilarious comedian and actress who originally hails from Chicago, Illinois. She's a beloved figure who reveals much about her personal life and her stand-up, often discussing the fact that she's a lesbian and covering various aspects and concerns pertaining to the LGBTQ community. In fact, her 2014 stand-up record Same Sex Symbol delved deeply into such topics and was acclaimed as one of the best and smartest comedy albums of the year. Now based in Los Angeles, Esposito is an in-demand performer who has appeared on TV shows like At Midnight, Conan, Marin, Drunk History, and she will soon be voicing a character on the Cartoon Network's We Bear Bears. This December, Esposito is marrying Rhea Butcher and taping her first special, A Mere Two Days Apart. She's headlining four shows at the Comedy Bar in Toronto between September 10th and 12th, and here to discuss some of these things is Cameron Esposito. Hi Cameron, how are you? Oh, great intro. I sound extremely prolific. Perfect. <laughs> my, my, the job here is to make you sound like you're just, you, you don't sleep, really. Well, that is an accurate statement. I try to sleep, but it's very difficult. Yeah, you... But with the constant planning of new things, you know? <laughs> That's the thing when you get, like, uh, people are always like, hey, you're... I saw you on the TV show, or I, you, I keep seeing your name. Uh, what happens is you go from a sort of small level, and then everything just, it's just coming at you left and right. You, you can't keep up, really. You know, you're right. I mean, I, I think what I'll say is that I used to have more time to prepare for things. That feels like the biggest change is, like, I have, like, no idea what's happening. So I'm just showing up and winging it. And I'm a pretty good uh, 
bullshitter. So I feel like maybe nobody even knows this, but 90% of the time I'm just like, sure, I can do this. Also, I've never done this before. (laughs) But that's the nature of the culture now. You just try things. I mean, you must find that. Don't you find that when something like that goes particularly well, that's the best feeling? Yes. I think that, well, also, I mean, it is the nature. It's what you're you're talking about. Everything is so... um, you know, it used to be that if you were stand up, you were kind of on the road for 10 years, then you got your sitcom, right? then you were on your sitcom, then you were maybe back on the road. There just were less options for work, what work could look like, places that you could be seen. You know, most stand ups didn't become actors, most stand ups didn't have book deals, all this other stuff. And now it's a little bit more standard that you have to be kind of, uh, Firing on all cylinders, I guess. You have to be a bit more versatile, actually. There's just so many outlets for what you do that you need to to conquer them all. Right. And nobody's going to take it from you and then then create your thing. You're kind of going to create your own thing. And the upside to that is that you get to make your own thing, which is amazing. And then the downside to that is that you can never kind of put yourself in somebody else's hands. Like, I think about, I think about Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David and that dynamic just doesn't exist anymore. That kind of uh, brilliant writer writing for a brilliant stand-up. Oh, right. I never thought of it that way. I mean, th- those were both. I mean, both of them had a bit of stand-up. Obviously, they both wrote a lot. You're saying that. I mean, there's there's some like Adam McKay and Will Ferrell. Some people would say like Funny or Die. Might... Sure. I guess I mean in that um, in that Larry created Jerry's vehicle. Like he just made the show that Jerry was going to be in. Right. He saw him and he's like, here's, you know, here's how this would look. And he made it for him. And not that that like took pressure off Jerry. It's just really different now. I'm sure there's a whole slew of other pressures when somebody else is creating your thing. Is it a bit more? Now it's just like, there is no thing. No <laughs> sitcom lasts for 10 years. So what are you trying to create anyway? Is it more of a survival of the fittest at this point? I think it's more about longevity. Hmm. Um, even as like a younger comic because there is no ultimate making it anymore. Not that they're like, you know, it's just that the separation became, I think, obvious a lot sooner. Just using the Seinfeld example again, like I'm sure there were people he started with that did not get the television show Seinfeld. And so then it was clear who was at the top, you know, and now um, there's just kind of a constant shuffle. You know, people get, TV shows and movies, and, and then they don't get those things for a while. And yeah. I think you learn kind of early on that it's just about sticking it out. Do you think that even subliminally, there's something to the fact that, okay, so Jerry Seinfeld, uh, this, the, he ends the show. Uh, Jay Leno does The Tonight Show. Chris Rock finds greater success as stand-up. But those two, Leno and Seinfeld in particular, made their names as stand-ups. They got a thing. They got a vehicle, a show. But then they were very adamant that they were going to go back to stand-up. They were very adamant that stand-up wasn't a means to an end for them. It was just something they had to do. They had their shows. They made their money. But they all kind of came back to stand-up. And I feel like as they discussed that more and more, it became apparent to people that having the sitcom, particularly comedians, I think, that having the sitcom really shouldn't be the end goal. You know, having your show shouldn't be the end goal. It should be, it should be persevering and 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 actually honing your craft as a stand-up. Did that hearing people like that talk about that? Did that impact you as a young stand-up? Yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right that those are the comics that came out of the '80s comedy boom, and so those are the comics that had these opportunities for the first time, the big level opportunities I'm talking about, and you're talking about like becoming a stand-up who hosts The Tonight Show or becoming a stand-up who has Seinfeld created, you know, yeah. created. Um, and I do think that you're right. We saw all those things end. We saw those comics continue to do whatever they would do or not do, you know? Actually, weirdly, like two nights ago, is it two probably? Yeah, I was on a show with Jay Leno. He like stopped in to do a set Um, and he's somebody that I met a couple of years ago when I did my first stand-up appearance on television yeah on on Craig Ferguson's show that's right yeah he was the other guest on Craig Ferguson 
And he was, he had just announced like either that day or that week he was leaving the Tonight Show. So it was all very fresh. And he came on that show and he hung out and invited me. There ended up being like some banter that happened on at the TV taping while I was on stage. And then I went over and sat on the couch between the two of them. People that are listening should just look it up because it's like a crazy moment. And if you don't like Craig Ferguson or Jay Leno, I think it'll make you like Craig Ferguson or Jay Leno. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I ran into him. I hadn't seen him since then. And first of all, he's like the kindest man in the world. And second of all, I like got to see him do, you know, 20 minutes worth of stand up. And it was amazing because he never, the whole time he was doing the Tonight Show, he would go out and do jokes, like sometimes nightly at a club that's near where his home is. It was like kind of a best kept secret that if you just went there, you could see Jay. Um, work, I, but work, I working out him. stuff and, and trying stuff, yeah. Yeah, I had never seen him perform before. And it's it was exactly what you were talking about where, you know, so he's like 65. I don't know when he started. Maybe he's got, like maybe he has 40 years of stand up under his belt. Yeah, yeah. And um, just to see somebody who has never stopped for 40 years. He was, people, comics have really differing views on, on Jay. He's a divisive person, but I was like actually laughing my head off because he was telling jokes with such savvy. Mm. I mean, he, it's like a craftsman, you know, he's been working in the trade for 40 years. So he just, his like delivery is impeccable. It was right. amazing. Right. Kind of like the Penguin or the Joker. I feel like, or Lex Luthor. I feel like <laughs> <laughs> as much as you, you know, you have this affinity for Jay, he has touched your life in some way uh, based on the Ferguson thing and you, you happen to run into him again. He is a comedy villain. I don't know that he'll never not be a villain in know. comedy. I think it really depends on who you talk to. I swear after this happened, the next night I was taping something else and I was talking to another comic who uh, currently works on uh, the new Late Late Show, which oh, is yeah, yeah. Gordon's show. Yeah. He was talking about how, like, Jay had come by and, like, donated a bunch of time to the writer's room and, like, to, to James to help them get the show off the ground. Like, I think he just... I think he's just a dude who was doing his job. Yeah. And, and didn't have a passion for hosting the Tonight Show in the way that like Conan had for creating Conan. Conan was the underdog, and it's like the underdog is is actually a lot of times a great place to be. No, no, that's and, and you're talking about the most recent thing, but th this is a guy. And sorry, I don't want to start an argument with Jay Leno when we're talking about Let's you. Let's do it. <laughs> you have to remember, like, so when the Leno Letterman stuff happened, I was, I guess, I must have been 15, and so I was right in that. Picking your heroes, maybe, or or, or ch taking sides. I was more about taking sides at that point, and I, you'd always kind of go with the rebel. And so when Leno engineered his way into the Tonight Show over Dave, I mean, that was the first thing. And then the Conan thing was a whole. The fact that it happened, like there was a sequel. The fact that Bill Carter had to write two books <laughs> about Jay Leno. I just think that, <laughs> I mean, I, I understand he's a very nice guy, and in, in a lot of ways, his, his. I guess I think that. Uh... I think what I my my takeaway from it is just that um, this is a brutal business, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people do a lot of things on a long enough timeline. I think everybody fucks somebody over, right. and it just so happened that he what he didn't have the likability that like, I mean, I, like Letterman is his likability to me and people that are in like the comedy spheres. His likability is immeasurable. I mean, he just doesn't care. He phones it in, but in a way that feels present. Like, he's amazing. Yeah. So, of course, if you're going to be a comic watching those two, and, you know, even without knowing the story, but, like, I guess all I'm saying is that I, ju I just don't, I don't believe anything is that I think everybody, <laughs> <laughs> everybody in this business He's done some crazy shit. Yeah, that's fair. It's not a good business, and that's part of the context. Sure. All right. All right. Let's let's let go, of Jay. What is a good business? Who does a job that they love that wouldn't fight people off 
get further along in that job. Apparently, Costco treats its employees very well. <laughs> That's what I've heard. People like working for Costco. You get the CEOs all have like there's stories like stories come out about like like beefs between like musicians or baseball players or anything where it's a job that relies so heavily on you believing in yourself. Right. Like of course you're gonna have a side of you that's a dick. Right. And it it doesn't really anyway, yeah, I don't know enough about the guy. I mean I've read a lot about Jay Leno. About, but I'm not talking about him anymore. Okay. I'm talking Generally. About him. Yeah. You're right. It's true. There's a, everyone's got a bad story. Yeah. That I think that it's really easy to anytime something comes up, it's really easy to focus on that. And there's just like so much we don't know. Right. All right. No, that's fair. That's fair. Now I wanna I wanna talk about you. Because we're supposed to talk no, about No, I want to spend the whole time <laughs> deconstructing feuds, analyzing them. Yeah, and like, you know, like let's name other feuds. Well, actually, I want to get to the opposite of a feud because you're getting married and taping your first special two days apart, which is kind of odd. This it's happening this December. This December, did you consider combining the two events? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, there was a there was well, it's like perfect because my fiance is also a comic, Rhea, and so she totally gets that that's what I wanted to do, and you know, a portion, a large portion of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be about the wedding, um, and then also some stuff about me about the wedding, you know, like just being at the point where you're getting married, and I wanted to do it like so it would be as immediate as a feeling as possible. And I wanted to do it in my hometown which is also when we're getting married. So mm -hmm. I was like, what if I just, and she was like, just not the night before. And I was like, okay, <laughs> two nights before it is. Um, oh, so the wedding precedes the special. No. Oh, the wedding is after the yeah. wedding. Oh, okay. Okay. The special happens. Then right. you've got the wedding. Okay. Interesting. Right. Cause I figure then, uh, knock out the, and it's at a much bigger venue or like, specials at this you know much bigger venue and then the wedding is a couple days later just at a really intimate place with just friends and family so it's kind of perfect okay <laughs> you're just stressing your I, I just feel like you're stressing yourself out unnecessarily but at the same time it'll be exhilarating it's just like what we talked about earlier that's the way it is now you just gotta pretend you know what you're doing and, and go I for don't it think, I don't think I have ever operated any way differently than this like that to me, I know it sounds crazy to a lot of people. To me, I'm like, of course, it makes perfect sense that I would do that 100%. I can, there's not one part of me that thinks I'm unnecessarily stressing myself out. <laughs> <laughs> and you're heavily involved in the wedding planning, I take it? We hired a planner, which is amazing. Oh, okay. Because, I mean, we obviously we're also, we also work with her. We basically say like, yes or no. And then she makes phone calls and stuff. Right. Um, okay. But also because, like, I it just couldn't focus on the details of, like, who does flowers. That's just, like, so not my personality. And it's also not Rhea's personality. So that's also why it's, like, a great thing because somebody else is doing all the detail planning for the wedding and we're, you know, picking from their suggestions and telling them what we want. And then for the special, I'm sure it's going to be, like, completely hands-on, I've done everything. <laughs> That's just, that's just how I work. Yeah. No, that's fair. Do you have a sense yet of, I mean, you've probably been working on the material for the special uh, throughout uh, the last year or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of how much wedding stuff is going to be part of this? Like, do you know where this, what the, where, what the form of this thing will be? So I know there'll be a significant chunk um, at the beginning. But then also, the way I did that album, which really, really worked, is that I booked like a, a big tour leading up to it. Right. So, um, because I tend to write a lot. And so, and I write on stage mostly where like, I'll talk about something once and then I'll refine it 82 times. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure how the tour is going to change the material for the special. Like I think, like I, I know what I think it is right now, but we have a tour starting in a couple of weeks. That will basically end right before December. So I'm curious to see how much will change or how many how much new stuff will get worked in there. Right. And are you touring with Rhea? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. She opens and uh, does like a half hour, and then I do an hour, and it's great. We've been doing that for the past about two years, which is also a really crazy re- position to put your relationship in, but it's wonderful. It's a nice. It's, it's a nice time. test, really. I mean, no, I'm sure you don't look at it that way, but it's you know, you, you're with the person you love. It's great. I yeah, think. we've been through a lot of all the things. I think it's more, um, you know, when you're, when you, because especially I do like a night in each city. Not typically, not not a lot of clubs, right? Um, and so, again, more do rock venues or theaters. So, because you're spending a night in each city, if you're apart for like two weeks, and I have been in ten places, or she's been in ten places. The diversity of our experience has already like branched so far that so many things have happened and so many different moments and it's really nice to have like a common memory bank. Right. Because we have some context for each other's lives as we're like rapidly evolving. But then you've also got this thing where as a as comedians who talk about your personal lives, you're living the same thing. So it must be are you working out material together for each other's acts? No, we never do that. Hmm. Um, but we also decided years ago that we would never um, restrict each other. So there's no like dibs sort of a thing where um, we can both talk about the same topic because generally we're always going to have a different angle, even if we talk about like each other or the same thing. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Now, I've been speaking to a lot of Americans of late and. I've been asking them basically how things are going, and I'm curious in, in your opinion, from your perspective, Cameron, how, how is America? <laughs> um, how does it, I'm, before I answer this question, how does it seem from your end? Pretty, pretty rough. Uh, I don't, uh, this, the, the week we're speaking was this horrific and terrible incident uh, where this disturbed gentleman, uh, killed people on live television Mm -hmm. and no i realize now that you're saying this like i don't know one thing that america is also really good at or specifically the united states is really good at is um exporting our news cycle oh interesting because like or maybe it's that we're terrible at importing other people's news cycles like i i feel like living here I have sense, some sense of going of what's going on in the world, but I also have lived other places um, and traveled a lot, and so I know that there are other places in the world where it that are equivalent uh, first world countries that have more context for themselves, and I think that's part of part of what's going on. Because I'm, I was curious as to whether you knew that that happened this week. Not like I was going to quiz you or anything. I just oh, I have no, no idea we, what we have we, Twitter. We have Twitter, right? But I mean, maybe you don't follow the same people. I mean, Twitter is a curated <laughs> experience. I mean, seriously, you know. <laughs> that's true. No, we we. You're <laughs> right. You're right about the, stuff that happens in Canada because, like, it's a very we're a pretty myopic country. Absolutely. No, I, I understand. We're we're not. Um, uh, well, I I can't say we're not. We we're going through an election of our own right now, and it's about the most controversial one we've had in some years, and at least in my lifetime, in terms of the... the... So I have no idea what you're talking about. Right, that's fair. That is what it is to live in the United States, because we. I I just feel like it's not something that is imported, for whatever reason. Um, And it could be arrogance... You know, whatever it is, it could be like how much money we had in the eighties. It could be anything. <laughs> when you but, um, w- when you come to a Canadian city or you you're touring outside of America, it's pretty standard for a comedian to get a local flavor, you know, and throw in a couple of local references in a at least in the opening. Do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I do that kind of everywhere that I go. Um, just because, like, it's, I think it's less, like, to, to rein people in as it is fun to talk about what feels present for the people that are in the room. You know, like, I, I just don't believe that I, like, pack up all my jokes and then they always stay the same and then I travel from city to city just, like, peddling the same wares. You know, I'm, I'm as a comic, I'm just very into adapting to what's going on. So, like, I love talking about how <laughs> in Toronto... 
the name of the children's hospital is Sick Kids. Mm-hmm. 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 Which is like the worst name for a children's hospital. It's just specific. It's just a specific name. It seems like a terrible thing to write in that large of a font because I'm sure there are some children that are going there for treatment that that can also read at the point that they go in there. Well, they know. Okay. The, the sick kids thing is a branding thing. It's a charitable aspect of the hospital. I agree with you. It's a little problematic. Sick kids is a crazy name for a hospital. Okay. You're right. You don't believe me. You have been living in Canada too long. <laughs> you know, it's just something I hadn't thought of. Uh, we know that if someone has gone to sick kids, that it's serious. Um, so I don't. That's my only connotation with that. You're right. It's it's a little absurd. I feel like it could also be called kids who are on their way back. Yeah, yeah. That's the uh, American kids. You know, I think it could be called a lot of other things. That's your American optimism, though. We don't have. <laughs> I just feel like that might be rough on a seven-year-old. You're right. You're right. Um, I, I will. We'll, I'll get. I'll make a call. We'll try to fix that. Yeah, let I don't know. Take that down. <laughs> but, no. You know, what we... else I wanted to say about um, America that, or about the states that relates to this conversation is, you know, so if you think it's dire here, I just think it's crazy that we seemingly. There are so many reasons that the things that have happened in the last like year and a half, um, what with the Black Lives Matter movement and with the constant uh, replay of mass shootings, like that that it, that's happening so often. There are so many reasons to feel passionately that these are terrible things, and you know, one is because you care about other people and two is because you care about your own safety yeah. and three is because you believe racism exists because you're not somebody who is deluded you know and then there's like maybe t- 10 or 20 on the list is i think some need to care about international reputation right shame and yeah. um even just because you and i know that it is fine to be seen as a bully and it is fine to be seen as um, like insensitive in the moment, but on a long enough timeline, the more of a bully you you are perceived as, the happier people are when you fall. I mean, it is like a high school sitcom. You know, it's like a we've all seen that movie, and how we can't see ourselves in that role is nuts to me. Are you, 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 it sounded like you were maybe talking about Trump, Donald Trump, because, and I want to ask a little bit about him uh, without, I I hesitate to just to give him more attention, but, um, you know, the right wing is normally not particularly LGBTQ friendly, but thanks to Trump, in particular, their current hot button topic seems to be immigration. And Mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious, when do you think they'll start attacking you and your community again? (laughs) Weirdly, the... The, the American people's sentiment is no longer with the conservative right wing on that. Yeah, I know. Um, and so I think it's not going to be a huge part of this election. There are going to be like fringe candidates who bring it up and talk about, because that's already happened, mm-hmm. people talking about like working to repeal it, that kind of thing. I think that will happen. But more so what's happening right now, and I don't know how much you're hearing about this, is so yes, it's like, it's so it's it's um racism towards people that i mean are general like weirdly also immigration is for some reason connected to latinos in our country which yeah. is weird because it's not obviously those are not the only people who are immigrants but when when somebody says illegal that's the code that they're they're that's Donald Trump using a coded word for like mexicans um, right. And not even, you know, not even other types of Hispanic or Latino people, but just like Mexicans are the problem. So I feel like that is going to be huge also because Latinos are a, are a massive voting block. Like the, in they are that population is going to outnumber white Americans very soon. We are that is like our largest. That's right. 
so, non-white group. So it's crazy to think that you can go out and say those things. I like I just don't understand what the logic is there. Do you do um, you do you think he's some kind of double agent? I I'm, I'm starting to think there's no right. because why would you alienate the most the, the the population that's growing the most and potentially could swing voters your way? Why would you do that unless you I were like know. trying I mean, to undermine the entire conservative uh, agenda? It doesn't make any sense. Right. So I think it's just, I feel like there was some like meeting that you and I don't know about <laughs> where everybody agreed on what like the fear words were uh-huh. and then, then that's how everybody proceeded. Right. Um, and it, the fear words are like illegal and uh, planned parenthood and abortion right now. That's the other thing that's happening is that, and also the other thing that's wild about this happening is that like, this is all happening with with this kind of Trump talking about Mexicans thing is all happening against the backlash of this epidemic in the states that's being revealed that black Americans are treated very differently by the police and that our police are having this huge recurring problem where black Americans are being killed in traffic stops or showing up dead um, or being like, and it's being filmed. I mean, I'm sure you know about all of this as well. Absolutely, so it's, yeah. It's also, it feels like maybe part of it is to not be talking about that. Because I, I feel like it's, it's like before Trump and the rest of the, these, before the, the these conservative politicians were talking about this, that wasn't where the national conversation on race was. Even though it matters to statistically a larger population yeah people like there are more latino it the conversation was about black americans and it's a conversation i think we needed to be having and now they're having this weird side conversation that is like useless because obviously i mean he's talking about like wall building and i just don't understand how anybody is taking him seriously Mm -hmm. then it's also unclear if people are taking him seriously well, if you believe the if you believe what's being reported as polls, then he is being taken seriously. And it's, but I don't know if I do. No because, one, you can't, right? Why would you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just really it's like very hard to tell who they're actually talking to and what those people are actually saying. Or what the point of this is. I feel like yeah. it could be just be media injecting some ex- what would they deem as excitement, mm-hmm. uh, so some or kind like, of circus you know, into this what might just be a state affair otherwise. Right, I think maybe he's trying to. Yeah, number one sells a ton of magazines and uh, it's a ton of clicks. And then number two, you know, he's maybe he's prepping for that next big book tour. Right. Yeah. Totally. Um, and I think the other thing is that what has happened for I think as people are talking less about LGBT people, mm-hmm. women, the way that these candidates are talking about women. I mean, we're 50 percent, we're like 51, I think, percent of the American population. Yeah. And we just haven't gelled yet. Like, we don't exist as a voting bloc. Um, but this could be the election where that changes. Right. Where women right. actually gel as a voting bloc. It's wild to me that we haven't up until this point, but this could be the election that does that. Well, it's very strange that, I mean, from what I understand, there is one... She's been, de- and I, her name escapes me right now. There's one Republican candidate, basically, that is a woman that right. is kind of a fringe candidate. Do you remember her name? I don't remember her name. Oh, uh, it's like Fiorini or something like that. That can't be right. Really? No, I think her last name is Fiorini. She sounds like a car. Anyway, <laughs> I feel like they they don't have any female candidates. I don't know if the Democratic Party necessarily do. They have Obviously, they have Hillary. Everyone's banking on Hillary. Bernie Sanders having a big thing which uh, I'm intrigued by, you know, a guy making sense. There's always the guy that makes sense that does well for a while. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know what's going to happen. Here's what I want to ask you about, because I, I, I want to figure this out, how, how all of this applies to you and your work. Because normally a, a time like this, when things are b- sort of bleak, and I mean, I don't know when things haven't been bleak in the last 15 years, but when things are bleak, it's normally a really great time for satire and comedy. Um, usually that's what happens. But I think John Stewart leaving The Daily Show when he did 
kind of throwing up his hands really and saying, I'm going back to, like, I mean, we all know he's going back to stand up. That's what he's going to do. But basically I got the sense that he's like, I can't take this anymore. And even me watching his show was getting to that point where the things I would normally laugh at are just so horrendous that I can't even laugh at them anymore. Did, does this stuff inform you and your work as a comedian? That's interesting that that's your read on that. I mean, I, I get what you're saying. I feel like maybe it's also just like he was getting out before the next election cycle because he's exhausted and has been doing that job for a very long time. Well, um, I, I trust that he was feeling restless and all that too, but I do think that it's been happening of late. His his monologues or, or, or diatribes seem not only more pointed, they just seem like, I don't know what to do with this stuff anymore. Um, he certainly. He's, I don't know if that's a function of his just, I mean, like, so he started at the Daily Show uh, in... 99, I think. 99? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like, he was at the Daily Show when 9-11 happened. You know, I mean, this isn't actually the worst time. Um, well, I would, I mean, you could argue that, I mean, obviously that was a huge shift in how particularly your country viewed viewed the world uh, and viewed the way the world viewed it. <laughs> and I think that that is certainly a marker for something. But the fact that the positive aspects that could have been gleaned from that situation haven't really been embraced. In fact, that things may have gotten worse domestically, internationally. I don't know. I, I obviously now we're, first it was Leno. Now we're talking about J. Stu, and it has nothing to do with you per se. But <laughs> I feel like I, I do think that it was getting to the point of exasperation for him. Like there's only so much you can satirize some of these things before they just it's just they're too evil they're too we're not making progress all of the the jokes aren't really leading to change uh, and i think ultimately you want to make change sure i mean maybe you and i have different perspectives on this i wonder are you a stand up <laughs> no I, i've delved into it a little bit yeah but not no i i i'm a one you know that's the other part of this the comedy we could we could have a probably a three-hour conversation about this, you know, with Twitter yeah. and the leveling of the playing field. Everyone thinks they're a comedian and a photographer. Um, and I've delved into it a little bit. Yeah, I have a little talk show that I do in Toronto uh, as part of a festival that goes on for five months. So I'd, I've been trying to write jokes, do stand-up, talk about my family, talk about my kids. And it's weird. Sometimes it works. And I don't, but I leave the jokes behind. I never hone them. I never work on them again. But it's part of my being. I've been watching comedy and stand-up since I was a little kid. Sure. So I study. Yeah, I, mean, I study it. I'm certainly a student of it, and sure, probably maybe have it within me. But I don't know. Right. It's, no. I mean, I guess I think like. I guess I look at that at his leaving, and I think like, oh, he wants to go make some more movies, or he wants to be off camera for a little while, because it's. Also Except that, did you not see the thing he did with the WWE? He was at he, he's the wrestling thing. He was at SummerSlam. He was he he participated in like a a skit, basically, and he got body slammed and hit a guy with a chair. This was like a week ago. Okay. So he just immediately went from the Daily Show. I didn't even know he was such a huge wrestling fan, and I've read about that. You know. Well, been... I guess that's what I'm talking about. I don't yeah. think that actually disproves what I'm saying. Right. Like, I, don't, I mean, so he he probably worked seven days a week for, you know, 15 years. Yeah. And that show happened. So I I think maybe, um, I will say as an American, it feels that people are as active talking about these things that you're talking about as they have ever been. Mm -hmm. Twitter has done a huge service of being able to allow for some coverage of things that The Daily Show used to be like. Maybe The Daily Show was the only thing that was talking about this. And now if you um, hear at your timeline or if you look at you know what's trending or if you follow certain comics um, or certain personalities people that you're like getting a great description of what's happening and everybody's jumping on with like their version of the joke yeah yeah this particular thing and i, I just think things are 
I think things are bad, but the reason things are bad is because there's an uprising on both sides and that will lead to something good down the line. That's my optimistic angle on it. Like, you know, for instance, the Black Lives Matter movement, what it didn't just come from nowhere. Like it wasn't that these things weren't happening and then they started happening. Mm-hmm. It was more that because people have cell phones in their pockets, they can prove something they shouldn't have to prove, which is that it still matters to be black, like that, that there's still um, stigma and ways in which being black in America can affect your life or even take your life. And so now we have that proof. And so we can share that. And it just actually feels like some of the things that we were talking about that, that have been accepted during my life time are not being accepted anymore. Yeah, that's fair. That I read into John Stewart's leaving the daily show as any sort of throwing hands up. I think like, I mean, if he's going and doing something else, that's him having a passion that he wants to go hang out. At. Like this is exhausting. This is an exhausting job. No, I and I and I know that, and I and I, I and, and that's why I'm curious how because on your last record, you it was a lot to do with your own personal history, and I think your for lack of a better term, your community. You know, people who would maybe share and could relate to your existence. It was very relatable to people outside of those communities as well. I guess I'm just curious how this atmosphere impacts you personally in your work. Um, I'm sure it does. Uh, I'm sure it's all kind of seeping in there, but does it? Do you, do you feel like comfortable directly addressing some of the things we've been talking about uh, from your perspective on stage? Yeah, I've always been uh, very kind of in the moment, talking about what's happening in the moment. Um, what is great is that now, because I've been in comedy in general for like 15 years and then in stand-up for um, nine, I feel like I actually have some of the skill to talk about these things. which is really nice because I think in the past, these are topics I would have wanted to talk about, but you have to, if you're going to talk about anything that is really charged or taboo you have to have the chops to do it so yeah i'm definitely talking about these things that we've been talking about i just had a like set that i did about planned parenthood that um kind of went all over the net the the internet and planned parenthood itself was sharing it oh okay it's pretty great because yeah there's a the opportunity to reach people where they are and give them some like hope that other people think like them is really massive right now. Right. Sometimes when you make your work so much about your own life or perspective or culture or sexual orientation, people expect to hear you discuss that all of the time. It's refreshing to me that you were just talking about being able to talk about well, Planned Parenthood or things going out in the world and, and, and get that uh, from your perspective, you know, talk about those things. But I'm curious, has your job as a comedian ever made you sick of being a lesbian? <laughs> You're talking about being a lesbian all the time. I respond to that. Um, <laughs> I think that I talk about my sexuality the same amount that all straight people talk about their sexuality. It's just that mine requires a little bit more... Um, context and understanding before I can get to the point where I'm just talking about it because in the States, this is still a relatively new viewpoint to be happy about. Like it's still really relatively new to be just sharing your life openly. Yeah. You know? And so, I mean, Ellen came out and it killed her career and then she had to come back and now she says the word wife on daytime television, which is really amazing, but she never, she was at a place in her career where like she never got a chance to tour a bunch after that and she never got to talk about it. So, I mean, really there, I mean, I guess like Tig Notaro has a new special out. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, she's from a very, very different generation than I am. Like I think Tig is in her late forties and I'm in my early thirties. And so, you know, I, I just started being able to talk about this because women like that, you know, broke down some walls and allowed me to be able to talk about it. 
So I don't think it's, I don't know that it's, I think it's more just like, I will over time eventually have to prepare people less for what I'm talking about. Like, I'll just be able to use the word wife and nobody will be like, wait, what? That's the goal. Yeah. In Canada, um, this is, this, this is different because I've, I have recently, well, when, when was the last time I was there? I don't know. I was doing jokes about, you know, in America, there's still an opposing force against gay people. And I'm sure there that, you know, it's not like every gay person in Canada lives in this heaven where they never are opposed. No, but it's quite the opposite, the actually. Force. Yeah. And, no, no, I know. What I mean is, I'm sure there are still some people that have a shitty time. Yeah. Because being gay is still being an outlier. I'm sure there are, there are still some queer Canadians that are, like, up against some shit. But the idea that they're, that they're up against some shit is not widely known. Whereas, like, in America, it's still really wild to just be like out on stage talking about it with confidence and joy right so i mean this is just part of your life you feel comfortable talking about it it's not it's not something you're it's just it's just a natural extension of your being i mean this is just what you're going to talk about every comic talks about their personal life right, right now it's yeah. like the movement comedy has has gone in direction also for me personally it matters to talk about it because i want to be uh, I, I like choose to be an example of a functional, happy adult that is also going to marry a woman, because I know that I know that there are gay people that don't have that right. influence. Um, right. So I'm happy to talk about it, but I also think that like it's it's almost weird to me when people don't understand why I would. Right, of course, You're right, and I wasn't questioning why. I just <laughs> my it was, it was a bit of a jokey question, I suppose. No, but no, I, I know. I'm not talking about you. Well, I sometimes when, when I when, believe how often I get this type of a question. It is a lot. Right, right, and but uh, I mean, I, even when I hear uh, Hari Kondabolu or somebody who he when when he was on the show, he talked about the fact that people now call him a like a, a, a racial comedian or a comedian who only talks about race, and he was he didn't even really have to defend it. He was just like, well, what else, Why wouldn't I talk about it? It's a huge issue. And the people who are saying that likely just don't want to address it. And so I just wonder about stigma or I wonder about expectation. I mean, it could very well be that you end up doing a special. You don't even have to talk about it at all because it's just not relevant to you in your, at that point in your life, right? Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure this will be on the next special. <laughs> <laughs> Things are not being fixed overnight here. Yeah. Uh, it's also not something I'm sad about. And I also, I mean, Har Hari and I are friends. He, um, he and I have very different styles. Um, I can certainly be as outspoken as Hari is, but I can also just be like, this is what's going on for me. Mm -hmm. um, my stuff is very personal. And so because my comedy is very personal, it's probably going to include some part of my personal life. Absolutely, yeah. No. The person I happen to be is this person. We were speaking earlier about how dynamic comedians have to be these days, uh, and sometimes you get a book deal. You finished a book recently. Oh, my God, I didn't even finish. I'm, like, still writing it. Oh, sh <laughs> oh man, did I just call you out? Oh, man, I hope your editors aren't no, you listening. you didn't call me out. I'm <laughs> openly telling you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You're working on a book. I am working on a book. Um... I think it's going to be great. It's also like the most difficult thing because my brain is really good at working on the next thing and yeah. like moving rapidly. And so sitting statically with like one thing to do is torture for me. Um, so wish me luck because after we get off the phone, I'm going to go write some stuff. Oh really? And, and mm -hmm. is there a shape? To, is it a is it a memoir? Is it a is it some kind of novel? Yeah, it's, it's autobiographical essays. So I got like seven of them done. I probably need twelve. So we'll see. Oh we'll man, see. you'll get you'll get those done this afternoon. I think I'm gonna write five essays this afternoon. <laughs> Absolutely. 
<laughs> I've been writing this whole time. <laughs> Hopefully one of them will be inspired by this conversation somehow. Who knows? Wonder. You never know. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to tell us about what's coming up next for you? I mentioned that you're coming to Canada, and I will mention it again in a moment. Uh, but anything else that you're excited about? Just come about? see me in Canada. That's all. I can't wait to be there. Your, your money has windows on it. I can't <laughs> wait to look at your money. <laughs> Once again, Cameron Esposito is headlining four shows at the Comedy Bar in Toronto between September 10th and 12th. Are there any other Canadian dates? This is all I was told about. Uh, yeah, no, I am going to be in... Oh, man. Now I'm... Now, now... Oh, man, I'm sorry. I didn't mean well, to put yeah, you on my schedule. No, no, it's totally great. Because I am also going to be... Oh, no. <laughs> I could pull up your I'm going to be in Vancouver. Oh, okay. Um, from the 1st to the 3rd. I know that is very far away from Toronto, but hey. It's Canada. Yeah. It's, it's still Canada. It counts. All right. All right. right. So. It counts. <laughs> it counts as part of Canada. <laughs> and are you at, uh, do you know the name? Are you at the Biltmore or something? Oh, the, the club in Vancouver? I'm sorry. I can't remember. No, that's right. fine. Forget it. I'll, I'll put it. Mix? Is that a thing? Yes. I don't know. Comedy mix. That is a thing. Okay, so... Where I am. Okay, Comedy Mix in Vancouver, Comedy Bar in Toronto. Her latest album is called Same Sex Symbol. It's available now by the excellent record label Kill Rock Stars, and you can learn more at CameronEsposito.com, which I should have visited before figuring out her tour dates at the end here. No, no, that's okay. That's not your job, it turns out. Now, is there a track from your record that we can play? Oh, um... Fighter Pilot. Fighter Pilot. Okay. Cameron, it was a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for your time, and... Uh, yeah, wish, man. Wish Have you... a wonderful day, okay? Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. I know there's still a lot of confusion about what gay people are. Like, that's what it is right there, right? You know, it's like that, that it's still an, that it's an insult. You guys, oh, I am so happy with where I am in my life. Just finally my look sorted out. You know, my gender reflected to you accurately, my gender being fighter pilot. <laughs> This is a new one. This is a new one. I'm wearing fighter pilot or David Bowie. <laughs> it took a very long time to get to this point. You know, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. That's right. And I didn't know I was gay, honestly. I didn't know I was gay until I was 20. Because I just, I knew no gay people. I didn't know gay was a thing you could be. For me, where I grew up, I honestly think it would have been as difficult for me to realize I was a lesbian as it would have been for me to realize I was a leprechaun. <laughs> like gays and leprechauns, I thought they were mythical creatures for parades. <laughs> and I should have known. Sometimes when people talk about gay people, they talk about needing to protect their kids. You know, like, we can't have equal marriage. We gotta protect the kids. <laughs> Which confounds me, because I don't understand where they think gay adults come from. <laughs> like, there's not an easy bake oven in the sky where it's like, ding, an adult! No, like, I came out like this. You know, just ready for rugby right away. <laughs> Just throw a girl over my shoulder, I'll run the ball in. Like, I've always been like this, and I wish I would have known. You should tell kids, because there are little gay kids, and they don't know what the fuck is going on. Like, I just thought all my girlfriends were like, we want our boyfriends to go home, right? So we can sleep over each other's beds and then hang out forever. Like, I thought that's how we all felt. And honestly, if you read Cosmopolitan magazine, that doesn't say it's not true. I mean, how many days a week do you guys think a suburban girl should wear a coonskin cap? Because if you said zero, I went with seven! <laughs> seven days a week, still sort of wearing one. And I wish somebody had been like, listen, David Crockett, there's a reason for all this. That would have helped me out. There you go, from her latest stand-up record, Same Sex Symbol. That was Cameron Esposito with Fighter Pilot. I hope you enjoyed that. 
It's very funny. The record's very funny. For what it's worth, it was one of my top five comedy records of 2014, which I wrote up for Exclaim Magazine. And it's very funny. I hope you enjoyed the track. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And I hope you'll seek out Cameron. She's uh, very thoughtful and very, very funny. All right. Well, that's the end of the show. What was I going to tell you? Oh, if you want to stay connected to the show on Twitter, at Vish Creative on Facebook, Creative Control with Vish Khanna. You can listen to the show on iTunes. You can listen to the show on Audio Boom. You can contact me at creativecontrol933 at gmail.com. You can listen to the show uh, when it streams, a version of the show, when it streams on CFRU 93.3 FM, which is based in Guelph. You can listen to it around the world at CFRU.ca. Or if you're in the Waterloo region, uh, which is in Ontario, it's, uh, it's on at noon Eastern Standard Time and, uh, as I say, 93.3 FM. If you'd like a T-shirt, you can still get some. I have some T-shirts left, uh, two designs. Uh, just tell me uh, what, uh, which one you want, what size, where I can ship it, and send me 20 bucks, and you get a T-shirt. I have small, medium, large, extra large. I've got uh, some T-shirts. And you can still donate to the uh, Patreon campaign as well, patreon.com slash creative control that's it for uh, this week coming up next on the show Ani DeFranco very excited Ani DeFranco's on the show so stick around for that or we'll not stick around go do stuff and check back in later and that's when Ani DeFranco will be on okay thanks for listening <laughs>